Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm Will. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons, and today we're talking about the state of this game. So so serious. <laughs> <clears throat> hey Brian. Hey Will. How are you doing today? Serious as fuck. <laughs> Uh, it's the final episode of the year, uh-huh. and usually we do silly episodes, but not today. Today we're serious. Not t- yeah, today we're real serious. We're talking about the state of the game. What is the state of the game? Well, this game has now been out for seven years, and we wanted to revisit an examination of D&D now versus when we started the show, which yeah, was okay. back at the very end of 2016. Um, plus, with the announcement of D&D 5.5, it seems like a good time to look back on everything the game has done right, and everything maybe hasn't done so right. Yeah, so they're gearing up for the next thing, so so a lot of the changes we're seeing in play are due to like what's to come, right? Right, and then also it's a good opportunity to talk about what we can probably expect in the coming years, especially with the changeover, totally. and what we hope for um, that will come. I do have hopes and dreams. I do as well. Yeah. So, yeah. We are people that play this game. (laughs) It's true. We're not automatons. Um, All right. So, first, let's go over the then versus now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our first experiences with 5th edition versus your current thoughts on on the game. Like, what has changed since then? Uh, For me, mostly, it's my knowledge of the game. That's true. Like, I now understand Dungeons & Dragons, in part thanks to the show and in part thanks to your games. So, like, with that and actual plays I listen to, I feel like I have a very complete understanding of what this game is supposed to be and how you're supposed to play it. Um, Right. You started with 5e. That was your introduction to the game. I started with 5e. I did play 4e. You did run us a 4e game. Yeah. And I got a good feel for that. A very RPG, like a a JRPG kind of feel. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, Uh, for sure. So 5e is a lot looser and Mm -hmm. more free form of a game Mm -hmm. than like... And, and, you know, I have experience with other systems now. So, like, I can compare it to to other systems like... um, uh, like Monster of the Week I've played and uh, like Powered by the Apocalypse games. And I, I haven't done a Pathfinder yet because uh, it's very daunting numbers wise. I don't like knowing you and what you enjoy about uh, the game. I don't know if Pathfinder is for you. For yeah, sure. I don't have the time to it's Pathfinder. It's very clunky and mechanical. It's very about like the the math, not the mathematics of the game, but like, yeah, the, the crunchy numbers of the game. Yeah, you can do bonkers stuff. Yeah. And like I know Pathfinder players, they tell me about their stories and I say Th- that sounds like some cool number shit. Right. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> for sure. It's fun, though. So for me, 5e, um, when it first came out, I think what impressed me the most was the simplistic elegance of it and managed to do a lot with very little crunch at all whatsoever. And it seemed very approachable and very easy to get into. And I think that still stands to this day. I think 5e, it, if you look at it compared to any of the previous editions, it's the easiest to approach. It's the easiest to get into. Um, it offers a lot without too much crunch. And uh, it definitely ha- has always had a less is more philosophy. I think that shows no better than the fact that there's only been one new class in the seven years since it's been released. <laughs> yeah. Like th- you have the base eight classes. Or is it eight? I think it's eight. Is it 12? It's a base 12 classes. Yeah. That's it. And, like, then, it like and then a few years later, they came out with the Art- Artificer. And then that was it. No right. other new class has shown up since. Everything else has fit into a subclass here and there. And they've really, uh, until maybe more recently, has have really trickled out even the subclasses. You know, through play testing and stuff like that. Yeah, I was going to so. say, there's a lot more subclass stuff out there, like in terms of new things. But like, right. you know, Hexblood, Dampier, we got that stuff. And like... So with, with 5e, I've always felt like... You know, if I can think of it, for the most part, I can make it. I can, I can, I can like mold the subclasses and class and race combos into basically what I want, with a few exceptions. Well, with 4e, it was more along the lines of like there was just so many options yeah. that if I wanted to do something, there was more likely an option for it. Yes, and I found that with 4e too. Like I want these specific things because I want to do funny meme stuff, and like that sure. was good. And we yeah. have a like check out our Patreon where I do funny meme stuff in our 4e game. Um, was it was that Isle of Dread? Isle of Dread. Yeah, yeah, that was a very fun game Fall with your Raiders. bear shark. Yeah. <laughs> um, while on the other hand, with fourth edition, um, reflavoring was in some ways harder, um, and other ways just as easy, but. Um, easy just as easy when it came from the dm side maybe a bit harder when it came from the player side um but yeah i want to ask what you think about uh like 
sort of the social direction the game has taken in terms of like the school of thought on how monster races are treated. There's a lot of people like monsters are people too. You know, it's funny because I, I guess a lot of people see that as new, probably because there's so many new players. That's probably yes. why people see that as new because that's been happening since fourth edition. And that comes with the approachability of this game, which I also forgot to mention, and like stuff like Critical Role being yeah. a very approachable show to like mm-hmm. expose you to the game. So yeah, there are a lot of new people that have like specific ideas about how the game should be played, right? Via like Matt Mercer and things like that. Sure. Um. It's funny. What I'm trying to say is, like, those ideas are not nearly as new as people seem to think. Because, yeah, like, I don't know. Name one of those races that is in 5th edition that people say that about. I guess orcs is, like, a big yeah. common one. Yeah, they were a race you could play in 4th edition. Right, yeah. Minotaurs, uh, uh, lizard folk, kobolds, any of those you could have played in 4th edition. There was a full racial stat for them. Uh, yeah. And I, it was the exact same argument then as is now of, like, some people were like, oh, but they're monsters. And other people were like, oh, but they're people, too. And, like, yeah. it's basically whatever you want. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah, the emphasis, the emphasis on them being more, like, people and less like monsters is a good thing. Mostly, uh, well, number one, because it's just a, a good moral thing. They're thinking intelligent beings, theoretically. Yeah. But the other point is, like, it also maybe forces isn't the right word, but it, it, it encourages uh, Wizards of the Coast to flesh out more of the lore and culture of these monsters, which creates really good material for DMs to work with. So it's fantastic. Yeah. And yeah. we did a whole game like with the stuff in Volos. Yeah, as yeah, well. yeah, we did. So yeah. that, that's like a testament to like, they did work towards, they did do that for 5th edition mm-hmm. and it, it stuck. I think it works well. Lots of people love to play goblins. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a very, very popular race. Yeah. Goblins, kobolds. Good stuff, um, man. And, like, there's a lot there for goblins, I feel like. Um, and there's a lot there for... I don't think there's as much there for kobolds as there is for goblins. Um, it's pretty similar, I mean. What do you mean by there's not much there for? I feel like goblins seem to have more culture, cultural stuff written about them and, like, mm. the way their culture works than kobolds. No, I mean, uh, Volos does a very big write-up on kobolds, so there's a lot there. Have we covered that? Maybe that's Yeah, why. we have. Okay. That was a long time ago. I feel like there's more to goblins. Because there's just kobolds, and then there's, like... And they they're like dragon people or whatever. And yeah, they they tend to be tied to and uh, attracted to worshiping dragons. But their whole thing is like they're very mechanically minded and clever. Yeah, trappy. they build traps, they build devices, they build their little inventors and stuff like that. Yeah, but the goblins have like there's goblins and hobgoblins and bugbears. Oh, and, I see what like, you mean. Yeah, it's more expansive because there's like a bunch of different subdivisions. And there's more. Yeah. There seems to be like more lore with hierarchy. It's very yes, important. Yes, very much. Like, so. I feel yeah. like there's more to draw in there than whatever we talked about for kobolds. Yeah, I mean, you might be right. You might be um, right. But those those are cool. Like wizards, you're right. They can expand on that sort of stuff. And like, yeah, and they are. And it, it just all it does is really add to the amount of material that your campaign, your character, your whatever can work with. And in a way, like writing dragon lore increases like the amount of options for like kobold lore. Yeah. You, oh, yeah. You absolutely. Want to tie that yeah. Stuff absolutely. Together. Yeah. You could be uh, kobolds that are descended from and or involved with gem dragons now. And yeah. We didn't really have the official stats for all that stuff or the official new lore for it until Visvan. So, what do you think about this? May be a little off topic from what our talking points are, but like the supplemental stuff, we don't get into non-official content on the show very much, but. We have talked about it off microphone with uh, Freeland a lot of the time about like Tome of Beasts and maybe it's come up on the show. I feel like Tome of Beasts does a good job like fleshing out the things that uh, 5e missed. Well, okay, so I do want to talk about that. That's on my list. So I got a list here of I'm starting negative and then we're going to go to positive of things 5e got wrong. And the first thing on my list is that monster blocks and 5e are boring as fuck. Oh, yeah, there it is. That, yeah, right. So it's right so there. So I was not off topic. <laughs> you weren't. You, that, you segued into the next thing nice. on the teleprompter. Um, so, yeah, Tome of uh, Tome of Beasts, I believe it's called. Yes. Is the Bone of a, a fantastic third party uh, resource book. It is like a super thick sexy monster manual with yeah, three C's all kinds of very uh juicy like monsters and creatures uh, a lot of fey a lot of dragons a lot of everything fiends um all all unique but fit very tightly into D D. like it's its own setting but it fits very snugly into canonical dungeons and dragons everything they write is just malleable enough for you to like move it into your own setting and uh i guess the most important thing to take from that is that the way they do their 5e monsters stat blocks are very interesting very dynamic um with lots of unique abilities which again is is from an idea i think they probably took from fourth edition or, or maybe they came up with their, on their own, but 4th edition was really, really good about that. Monster blocks are anything but boring in 4th edition. 
And I'm not sure why 5e ended up with such boring monster blocks. They're just overly simplistic, not a lot of unique abilities. Uh, they're just pretty cookie cutter. Yes, I, I feel like the cookie cutter nature is like sort of like the spirit of 5e in a lot of ways. Sure. And that's good and bad, right? Like right. cookie it, cutter is cookie they, cutter. They want to leave it to you to to come Can't up with the rest. With right? Yeah, like here's Which the basics. is the way that you and I uh, play the game anyways. Right. But the spirit, the true spirit of Dungeons & Dragons is do whatever you want. Yeah, be creative. Yeah. yeah. Um, another criticism of 5e, and it's one we make here all the time, <laughs> dark vision everywhere. Yeah. Everyone seems to have it. And so many have it that like, it's almost more of a hindrance to the DM when one person doesn't have it because it's it's I don't know for me it's like more annoying to keep track of it for one person than for like you know than it to be reversed where it's like oh yeah one of your party members has dark vision like so they have a leg up an advantage well it feels instead of that it feels more like if you don't have dark vision you're super handicapped because so many of everyone else has it yeah I mean it really. I hate I I don't really like to this is a tough subject. Uh oh. for for me I think because just because like yeah, the game kind of sets it up so like most people have dark vision and you might get the one random that doesn't and like maybe they want you to play up to that or like figure out a way around it and like like I kind of don't like the way like like treating the player like they have like the disability right there. Like they do in a way. I mean like it makes it it makes it tough. What ends it you. ends up leading to DMs ignoring it a lot of time. I think right. It so gets hand waved. I played fourth edition for a very long time, and the way vision worked with four E was you had normal vision, and then you had low light vision, and then you had dark vision. Okay. And I would say like a third of all the races had normal vision, um, and then a bit, a bit more than a third had low light vision, and then very few races had dark vision. <laughs> And what it did was it led to a sliding scale where everyone had a unique level of vision, depending on what was going on. And um, it, I don't know, it, it, it had the opposite effect. It just like, yeah, if you only had normal vision, that did suck. Like you, you were less able to see, um, but it didn't make it so like you're blind and everyone else can see because they have dark vision. Yeah. It was like a sliding scale, and it seemed to work really well. And I think that's all you would need to do to fix it is, like, make dark vision itself a bit more rare and then make low light vision a thing. So it's like if you're an elf, you have low light vision, which means, like, you are capable of seeing just as well in dim light um, as you are in normal light and a bit better in darkness than you would be otherwise, but not so much so where it's, like, you can just see in darkness. Yeah, I feel like the application here is, like, you have dark vision, so you go into the dark room where we need to like flip that whatever switch that guy up front told us about it's like something like that right yeah but, like you have low light vision like i need to be in front so right i can like right. or off to the sides and like we put the people without the dark vision in the middle if we're going through a dark area to protect them yeah well right now it feels like if you are in a party and you don't have dark vision everyone else is annoyed because it's like oh now we gotta light the torches for the n normal vision guy and give away our location and put yeah. ourselves at a disadvantage you know, because this one guy can't see in the dark. Yeah. I and guess, that's I not guess. a great feeling. Or the uh, the opposite where, like, we don't light the torches and you got to fucking suck it up. And, and that sucks, it. too. That's well, not yeah. the funnest feeling either. But so. it's, it is it is a reality of it. Like, sure. Like, yeah. if you are in a party like that, like, you have to deal with that at some level. And you should. I don't think you should ignore your dark vision is what I'm saying about, about dungeon mastering perspectives here. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have those players without dark vision, like, you get creative with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do you can do some things. I mean, like there's things in the game now, like blind sense. You know, like yeah. maybe you're a human fighter, you don't have dark vision, but you have blind sense, and that can be in some ways more useful than dark vision. Sure, it's something you can apply. But usually, your blind sense is limited to ten feet. So yeah, I mean, but, but it's, it's still, it can still ten feet is not bad. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very useful. Um, so yeah, that's one thing that I think people can nitpick about is dark vision. Another thing is for me, the skill system has always seemed a little bit. Like something is missing for me when I compare it to my experience from previous editions. Um, I think part of it is that there, I don't, maybe, and maybe I'm wrong here, but it feels like there's not a big enough gap between those who are trained in a skill and those who are not trained in a skill. Right. Um, okay. In, and I mean, if you go too far in the other direction, it can be bad too. But like in, in fourth edition, I remember like if you were trained in Arcana um, and you were level eight and you had to make an Arcana check, 
you had such a huge advantage over someone, a fighter who's not trained Arcana, who's the same level, where like, uh, I, I'm just throwing random numbers out there. So like, if you were a wizard at level eight, you probably had like a plus 13 to your Arcana, mm. while a fighter literally had like a plus zero. And so like, you could both roll on it technically, but like the fighter's just not going to get it. And it actually discouraged the fighter from even trying to do it, which maybe on the surface doesn't sound like a good thing, but I actually think it's a good thing because I think the problem with 5e is because that gap is much more compressed, your your orc fighter who has a negative to intelligence is still going to give it a go because the chance is still like, I don't know, 20% that he might get it. And right. it doesn't really make sense. You well, know what I mean? That's the thing is like, should you even allow somebody to roll on that? And the, yeah, and that could be a fix. It, you, it could be a fix of like, you're not trained as in Arcana, a DM, you don't know to look for this. Yeah, if you're not trained in the skill, you can't roll for it in extreme circumstances. That could be a homebrew rule. But that's the thing is it has to be a homebrew rule. There's nothing built into the system to, to make it so. Yeah, there's also like, yes, you can roll on it because like magic exists in the world. Like, right. But like, can you solve like complex math problems on the fly like can you detect this magic like which could be a, like a similar skill level on the fly with no training right maybe you just get a feel like you can roll well but your your good roll result is going to equal less than the same role yeah, from somebody trained in arcana and that's an, that's definitely another way to do it another uh, idea i had is maybe we could have a more established nuance between failure and success where it's like um a like a uh uh there could be like a partial success, a total success, and like uh, a masterful success or something like that. Yeah. And like depending on what like area you got on the DC check, you get more information or advice or et cetera, et cetera. That's why I like uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games a lot is because you roll D6 mm -hmm. and a four and a five on a D6 roll is usually a success, but it comes at a cost. Like one of the things that happens is a complication occurs and it doesn't have to really relate to the thing you're trying to do. Yeah. You succeed at it, but because you succeed at it, something bad happens as a consequence too. Oh, I really like yeah, that's that a cool, that's a cool mechanic. Yeah. yeah I yeah. love putting that in six is a full success. And like, if you roll two die, which there are mechanics right. to get extra die double six is a crit, and you, you blah, could blah, blah. apply something like that. Uh, maybe a little less extreme two skill checks to maybe I do. make it. Feel, I do it. My yeah. games now. Like, okay. That, like, that's cool. That's how I'm going to run my games from here. Fourth is like, Hey, if you get like a 10, 10 to 15 on like a like a check mm -hmm. like that might be like yeah you jump the chasm but like like on the edge you hit like a lip of the rock that breaks away right. and the next person that's going to jump it's going to have to jump farther like, oh yeah yeah see i like that that's like really that. cool yes. yeah it's like, a very good idea punish punish light punishment you did it but like you didn't do it as good as you could have right you exactly could have cleared the whole thing yeah like, yeah absolutely yeah. Um, another small, uh, most of these are all small criticisms, but another small criticism I have is I actually feel like level one in fifth edition is way too scary for everyone involved. Yes, um, absolutely. You were just, you were so fucking squishy. And as a DM, you're just so scared that you're going to kill everybody. And it, it has led for me personally, I almost always start my, um, my campaigns at level two at a minimum. And usually I'm going for level three. Um, yeah, I was going to say level two is a good like substitute for like if you really want a level one campaign just start at level two and don't level up for a while. Yeah, exactly. Um, another thing, too, and I understand why they did this because they're trying to mitigate like multi-class like e exploitation. But um, you getting your subclass at level three more often than not, in my experience, feels a little weird because it's like, I don't know, it's just it. In my experience, my character already knows what path they're on. You know, exactly. it's just so just, strange yeah. to decide of like, oh, well, now I'm level three. Let me decide to do. I've always thought this. Yeah, I'm it's like, just a uh, little strange. It's like, is my training kicking in now? Like, I'm yeah, out, I'm out in the right. Field. Exactly. Like, I'm out in the anywhere. field. Yeah, exactly. And, and I it's think like, the true start for a campaign is actually level three. Like, yes. And without downtime. You know? So I think the way to fix it is like your subclass probably should be chosen at level one, but maybe your your heavier like your better features don't start until level three and beyond because of course they're trying to mitigate people like dipping a multi-class level in right totally yeah. so like maybe you just get something small at level ones and and then another small thing at level two and then level three you get your first big thing but like the flavor is already there from the beginning and yeah. it doesn't feel like forced at like again you're out in the field right and right suddenly exactly. i can summon dragons or whatever the your bullshit is it's like yeah. a it's a lot like pokemon level ups like you're in mid battle and all of a sudden your pokemon like 
like in the anime especially like the Pokemon will evolve mid move to like do the thing that they're trying to like save Ash from fucking whatever peril he's gonna <laughs> right right like right. his latest Dragonite grows arms or his Dragonair grows arms and becomes Dragonite to like carry him out of a pe- like a perilous situation right right Th- that feels like this but it's dumb for fifth edition to right. like do that what I really like is a level one campaign maybe you get a uh, like a session zero at level one. And then you get a little bit of training, mm-hmm. and now you're level two when you go out to do the mission. You mm. do the mission at level two, and then something bad happens. It's like, oh, we, we almost fucking died. Like, <laughs> let's have downtime and sure. train. But like, that's and the now fact we have subclasses. You, but you, look, you just had to fit it into a very specific set of events had to happen exactly. in a certain yeah, way. I it understand. shouldn't have to be that way. You yeah, know what I mean? that, but, but that's a way to, that's solve a way to make it work. Or sure. just start at level three. Level three is a pretty basic, ah, I don't know, it's not basic enough for new players. That's the problem. Right. Which it's, is why I usually do level two, but yeah, the second I hit you with the subclass stuff, it's like, wait, I just learned how to swing my axe. Like, right? What the fuck is rage? Yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right? You know, you're still um, working that stuff out. Although you do get rage at level one, but I, your your point still stands. I mean, yeah, I understand it, your point. Da- yeah. They're they're still working on rage, and they're they don't even know about danger sense. You exactly. Gotta tell them that they're right. Spider Man. Exactly. Um, Another nitpick I have as a dungeon master, and the thing is, I didn't notice it until I started like reading about this particular criticism and that's that in fifth edition plotting a combat or encounter for your party is actually not easy at all no like balancing it is not easy at all i fucking accidentally killed josh freeland's character like just because i didn't balance my combat properly it, it, it is just it's a constant struggle as a dungeon master to get it right because the challenge rating system isn't great no, it, it's not very it, easy. It doesn't. It's not a good barometer. It's super ambiguous. It, yeah. it's loose. It can and fluctuate greatly. Like look at the Dullahan. Like right. that was such a weird wonky. It's a like beast. what is this challenge rating? Yeah, what is the challenge rating? Makes no sense. But um, going back to my fourth edition days, I that's what made me realize it, it was like, oh, I had no problem whatsoever. It was so easy to just calculate it up mathematically. Yeah, fourth edition is so quantified. It's so quantified. It's great for battle. It's the, great the battle for battle system was my favorite part of fourth yeah. edition. Essentially, the game is the same the, after that. Yeah, exactly. But um, but yeah, like it was. I remember having a lot more fun plotting encounters in fourth edition one because the monster stats were much more interesting and number two balancing it was much easier mm. instead what i end up doing is i'm trying to find monsters that are interesting tending to fail and having to reflavor and or you know add on to them and then struggling to to guess if this was too hard or too easy and what it has ended up leading to is me having to fluctuate different stats during combat so yes. that the combat is the right difficulty. <laughs> Fuck this thing. And you, I'm like, you know, early on, this thing doesn't have enough HP. Yeah. And I to double it. Yeah. And I almost never had to do that in fourth edition. Mm. I was and it was, it dawned on me. It kind of uh, sucks. I don't want to, do, I don't want to do that. I feel cheap. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but you no, know, you, you have to if you want to be a good but DM, I you're gonna be, have to do it. Yeah, you know? you, it's your job to make the combat challenging mm-hmm. and it's really hard to foresee that. Um, you know, live off the experience of your previous encounters with your party, know your party well, and mm-hmm. know what your monster's max HP output is. That's your best defense, I think. Right. You don't right. want to one shot your guys on accident, which no. is what I was doing. Yeah, it happens. Yep, it happened. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I killed Jake's first character within the second, uh, the second mission, the second. It's uh, true. Uh, it, was, it was like the third play, the third yeah. play, sit Something down. Like that. Uh, yeah. and, and a lot of that was bad luck, too, but like still. Yeah, a lot of it was bad luck, but yeah, yeah that, that dude died. He like triple died. He double died. Um, and then triple died. Yeah. Um, my my final small criticism of 5e up to this point is I think there's a slight over reliance on spells, spell casters, and spell or magic using characters. Okay. There, there's not enough non casters. There's essentially, really realistically, two the fighter and the rogue. And even they have like spellcasting options. The barbarian kind of counts if you go down certain routes, but like a lot of the stuff the barbarian does is very magical in nature. Yes, um, uh, like supernatural. Yeah, and like that's cool. Like this is fantasy. Like I, uh, most of the characters I play, regardless if there was more options or not, uh, would probably be magic users who can do a little bit of melee fighting because that's the kind of characters I like to roll. But like there should be a ranger without spells that is also very effective because like. Um, that's an entire archetype that's just completely missing. The Aragorn son of Arathorn archetype, which is classic. And it's a style of gameplay, too, that the DM is responsible for kind yeah. of, like, you know, putting out in front of everybody. Right. It just seems like everyone's got spells. And and it got maybe, worse. It got worse throughout the, the game's life. Yes. And it's going to continue to get worse because the big complaint 
and that synonymous with this is like my fighter is not interesting because look at that wizard over there blowing everyone the fuck up with fireball. Right. And I can't do that. And it's like, yeah, but you also like you also get to take a hit from a sword. Right. And right. like but then they have that problem too at the high level, even the, the AC is gonna scale for the wizard because like your a little player bit. Yeah. your player the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Your player right. is gonna complain about their low AC. So the wizard I think what happened is like wizards got better AC and mm-hmm. fighters and like barbarians and stuff like that got more magic. Like right. the ranger got more cool magic-y like stuff right. as the game continued to live. Yeah. Like a Drake Warden, that's like fucking magical as fuck. Right. Like you riding a dragon dog. Like yeah. I know that's And an it's animal. a dragon that you summoned. It's not even one that lived out in the wild. Yeah. You, it's like it's one you've conjured into existence. <laughs> I know. It literally it materialized like yeah. the blue spaghetti and, in and if of it the dies, wild. it's absolutely meaningless because you can just create another one. I know. It's so weird. I have a player yeah. with the new Beastmaster mm-hmm. and like I have a cool thing because he doesn't like have a good backstory necessarily, so we get to kind of work on it as we play. Right. I'm like, you were born of a chaos god, and when your goat dies and is reborn, if he finally fucking did it, I've been waiting for him for several games to do it. As a goat died, and then he didn't bring it back for several games. I thought that was weird, but like when he did, uh, like its bones appeared and it like reformed and it's like skeletal and muscular structure like formed. It was super evil. That's, yeah, right? yeah, I, I love like, it. Though. There's That's something amazing. wrong with your goat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like figure it out. Yeah. Like, do some int- introspection because you summoned it with your power. So that means there's something wrong with you. Right, right. And like things really like, cool. that. I like that. that. I mean, that's here. I like I had to do that. You know, like it's not just there. Yeah. It's like, but if I don't do that and like every time he resummons his go, it's going to be weird. Right. Like things are going to I plan for things to get weirder and weirder until mm-hmm. he like looks into it. Right. Uh, but like. That's something I have to implement to make it meaningful to right. like resummon that thing. Yeah, exactly. But otherwise, you exactly. just spam the goat. Yeah, spam exactly, the exactly. And yeah, I, I'm not a fan of that, but you know, that's just <laughs> it's my like, criticism. I saw a meme with the familiar, like, uh, "Go get him, buddy!" And it's like your familiar is like got tears in its eyes, giving you a thumbs up as it like carries a bomb into enemy territory. Um, yeah, exactly, again. exactly. <laughs> So with the okay. familiar, I'm okay with the, the sure, monster. Sure. Maybe not so much. Right, you're right. supposed to care about that thing. You, you are. You're supposed to be bonded with it. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, we will get into the things that Five E got right, but after our short rest. Yeah, we like Five E. We like Five E a lot. We're about to get a lot more positive. <laughs> Sorry real for quick. nitpicking it. <laughs> We've returned. Indeed, we have. Stick around for the end of this episode where we're going to name our final beholder. That we, so we've been building <laughs> beholders. This is the year of the beholder. This is not a beholder episode. No, but we're going to close it out big. Also. Also, I hope you guys enjoyed your holidays. Please send me a postcard in the P.O. box. I would love to see one. Absolutely. The, no, the P.O. box address is in the notes below. Uh, we have a Patreon. We have an actual play game called Super Quest Saga. Please check the, that stuff out. It's a great way to support us. Indeed. So let's get back to talking about 5e and where it is today. And let's talk about the good things. Yes. And uh, the first good thing I want to talk about when it came to the implementation of 5th edition is cantrips. Hmm. Cantrips in this game are absolutely what I would call perfect. Um, okay. At will damage option, that scales. Um, and you got to remember that before, well, before fourth edition, spellcasters did not have, cantrips were not damage dealing. And if they were, it was pitiful. Uh, it was completely utility stuff or even, even like lower than what I would call utility stuff. Just like visual aesthetic stuff that really didn't affect anything. I mean, this boosts um, skill checks, I feel like. Like, if you are clever about it. Yeah, maybe, maybe if you were clever about it. Um, And then the only way you were doing damage, as uh, I'm going to just use the wizard as an example, um, was by burning a spell slot, and you had limited those at low levels. um, Yeah. Or carrying a crossbow with you, which a lot of wizards do did in those days. Probably should still. Um, And you probably should still, maybe a little bit, but like... I don't know. For me, when I first got into D&D, the idea of like being a wizard, but then also having a Big ass heavy crossbow for which it got real. Just didn't feel like the flavor I was going for. There's you know, a kind I mean? of magic they don't teach you in college. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Gun magic. So um, obviously, fourth edition comes in with powers as a concept, and you have at will encounter and daily powers. So this is the birth of like, oh, the wizard every turn can cast, um, you know, uh, scorching ray or ma- magic missile or. Um, fire burst or whatever those powers were called then. Yeah. Um, and it was this at will damage and it was great. Um, 
obviously coming over the fifth edition, we're kind of going back to the old ways, but they don't want to lose that. So they come up with, well, fuck it. Cantrips will be exactly what at will powers were for spellcasters. And this way, spellcasters can do damage every turn. It won't be super, super impressive, but it'll be, you know, it will scale. It will be respectable. Yeah. Um, it will have use. And then if they really want to actually, you know, be the big bad caster that they are, they can burn the, the actual spell slots. And so I just think it's perfect. It's great. Yeah, I like... Uh, like cantri- and it wasn't always like that. Cantrips on the high end, Firebolt and Eldritch Blast, right? Those are like the big damage output ones. Yeah. And Eldritch Blast is probably the most OP cantrip in sure. the game. Sure, sure. Uh, but the class that gets it typically is the Needs Warlock, it. and they're mechanically bad without it. Exactly. So yeah. No, so they, it, there's it's, that. It's well put to together. Yeah, the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about for 5th edition is it really, really is the most approachable and most easiest to learn of any edition. And um, Yeah, 4th edition was very daunting yes. when you saw what the possibilities were mechanically. Mm-hmm. And then dungeon mastering that for the first time was probably going to be a nightmare if yeah. I ever tried it. And if 4th edition is daunting, uh, 3.5 was more daunting by far. Mm. Um, 3.5 is still like... Very play- popular. Yeah, it's still yeah, played. Because it's a very, very good game. But um, but there there is no, it is no small coincidence that upon the iteration of fifth edition, this game has boomed to the point where the community is now ten times bigger than it ever was, maybe more. Like it has grown so big that I feel like I am actually part of a sub community that has a totally different experience. You're like the old tape. guard, yeah, yeah like okay. definitely. I which can is see funny that, because like there is an old guard that is much older than I am. Uh, when it comes to second and third edition, we see you in the comments, by the yeah, way. Yeah, we do. Um, we appreciate. But my you. point is, like, it's not even that I, I that we're part of the old guard. It's that there is like, you know, when any community gets big enough, like it starts becoming more. What's the word I'm looking for? Not mainstream, but like popularized. It, like, yeah, it just starts to divert into like a more homogenized like idea of what it is and all the the niche people, the like oh, I liked it before it was cool. Like it oh, moves yeah, away from what they There's liked. There's like elitism and gatekeeping going on. Yeah, and I am starting to kind of see that. Um but that being said, like it there there's no small coincidence in that this game is both approachable and very easy to learn and is a very good thing because the community has grown exponentially. Yeah, gatekeepers are just part of like there's a lot of gatekeeping and nerd culture. And they've always existed. And they're and, going to exist. And, th- yeah. and now it's funny. They're on both sides of the fence. There's mm-hmm. like gatekeepers of the old guard, let's call it. And then mm-hmm. like the gatekeepers of the new guard. It's like the the crit roll way. And right. Like, like, you know, what they see on TikTok and and like the what the community is doing like in the current age. Right. And I guess we can talk a little bit about crit roll for a second here. Because like I respect crit roll. I think it's cool. And I yeah. think it's great for the game. I don't know how to feel about the fact that like a random group of players now dictates so much of like what the community both expects and demands from this game because I'm not part of that community and it just feels like my voice is very different from a lot from the majority now Mm. and it's fine I'm not like you know like I'm not complaining but I'm not sure how to feel about the fact that like this one group that was just a bunch of players now kind of is like the pantheon of the game itself it's very strange to me i mean yeah i feel like the crit roll cast is a big for the for the newer generation of player that's Mm -hmm. the face of the game for sure right right you don't get into D &D without hearing about it and i'm noticing that with my new players that i i'm like running games for now Mm -hmm. it's like you kind of got to look at what they got to offer i mean they they the gunslinger class the thaumaturge the the cromp Chron- chronergy and like the stuff that mm-hmm. has made its way into official content. Right. I like it a lot. Oh yeah, it's great. It's yeah, great. and and I like what they're bringing to the table literally and and, yeah. and figuratively. And I don't think that they're the ones like dictating like they're not imposing their no, way to I don't play think on that, I, yeah, I don't think that they're but, I'm not but they're not actively imposing, doing people it. are imposing that on themselves. Exactly. And others around them. Right. And that's the thing I find that's so strange is like I, I think the understanding that D D is like there's no one way to play and that like the crit roll way is one of the many ways to play. Yeah. But totally. it is it I guess what I'm trying to say is crit, the crit roll I the idea of crit roll is becoming the default. Yeah. It's which a, it's which is so funny because I this actually this did happen to me earlier in my life when with 5th edition Forgotten Realms became the default. Right. And that was bizarre to me. 
Um, uh, they, there's popular books, right? Uh, yes. And we're going to talk a bit more about that later in this episode about the whole Forgotten Realms thing that we're now moving away from, which I find hilarious, but also we'll, we'll get into it. But now Crit Roll is, be- is slowly becoming the default for the community. And I find that interesting as well. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how much foothold. Like, I'm really not like I, I highly respect everything that they do. The more successful they are, uh, it paves the way for more success in the D&D community. Yes, absolutely. So please keep doing what you're doing. We yeah. love you guys. It's great. I, they're all very, very talented. Um, and they're they're doing a big project and like a yeah. high amount of respect. Absolutely. Uh, it's just not my thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I, I mean, we yeah. like a different style of play here and like, like the way we address the lore. But like there's a lot to take from Crit Roll too. I mean, they do a lot of things really, really well. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm a fan of of um like it's just the same old thing i feel like is the hindrance here which is the gatekeeping aspect of, of right of cultures right, yeah and like i'm never a fan of elitism and like the, I, I really like the fluidity of 5e and do what you want culture yes and, very much and so. the writers and creators promote that and i think that's good to have those voices kind of at the same time because right. like we said like crit roll's not imposing that on you you're imposing that on yourself and that's right. okay too like you get to play the game you want to play and if crit rolls what you know like you get to eat that meal every night for dinner if that's what you want. You know, mm-hmm. like, right. do that. So uh, back on the things that Fi- 5e does well, um, advantage and disadvantage as a mechanic was mm-hmm. revolutionary for the game. It is both elegant and simple, and it's just very effective. It just It's a really easy thing to solve a lot of problems. It's like, oh, you did a thing. Uh, to, to give yourself a better chance, you have an advantage. Oh, something happened to make you less likely, now you have disadvantage. It's just real simple, and it's simple to understand, and it was just a beautiful mechanic, and it was a great idea, and uh, yeah. I think it's so good that it gets misused. Oh, you know, what like, do you mean? It's, 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 easy to, it's easy to throw it around too much. Or, yeah, sure. Or to like implement it poorly. Like I really think to give a player advantage, you need to be in an advantageous state. Sure, you know it, it's self-explanatory, right. really. Yeah. I just think that gets away. Oh, from you some think people. people are more too lenient with it? I think really? so. Okay, yeah, they're giving it out way too much. I like, can see that. Um, what do you think about just like static bonuses? Um, Before you did that, right? Static bonuses are a double-edged sword. Well, they exist in this game too. Yes, but like so, like very limited. It is, but a shadow of a shadow of its former self. Right. Um, as a player from back in the day of fourth edition. There were few joys in this life as stacking <laughs> bonuses in very strategic ways to just be like, my fucking Hexblade does cold damage with a rapier of ice. And I have found feats and bonuses and races to stack it to such a degree that when I hit you with my winter sword, you fucking die a frozen corpse. Hell yeah. Because look at all these bonuses. It sounds so like much fun. It's very fun. Yes. And Pathfinder is like that as well. And so it was 3.5. Um, that being said, it is a lot to keep track of. And as a dungeon master, you'd be like, wait, so you get a plus 13 damage to this? Why? And it's like, well, because of these 17 different reasons. Oh, my God. If like, you're not on your game, someone can fucking bamboozle you with rules. Yeah. And and it just, yeah it's, it's a lot to keep track of. Um, so I'm not as big a fan of step. And I, I think the, the static bonuses that are the worst are the ones that are situational. It's like, oh, whoa, don't forget that you actually get a plus two on this turn because of this and this reason. And, oh, yeah, you get a plus one because of that, too. I think too many of those. Are, yes. Yeah, they get, they get a lost in the weeds. So, but like, I think the most common one in this game is cover, right? Right. That's the one. And cover is, like, really the redhead stepchild of the rules when it comes to this game. I know. I, yeah. I think people for kind of forget about it. Yeah. But, like, what is it, like a plus five, plus three sort of thing? It's Something like, it, like it that. that I would have to relook at it because yeah, I don't use the, it that often. We can look at the rules for cover, but essentially, like you get quarter, half, and three quarters. Yeah. And what'll happen is I'll read them, I'll understand them, and I will forget them within the hour. Right. And you need to have that. Basically, like cover is one of the rules I have up sometimes. If yeah. I expect there to be cover, do I have a rogue in the party? Do I have people that like to hide behind fucking whatever? You know, yeah. like you know, no sort of like if you are behind the monster and. This happens with cone damage and blah 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 blah. You know, right? Exactly. It's 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 out there for you to like look at and read and like get familiar with. You could use it or not use it. Yeah. Um, but th- I think that's a good one to have. Um, 
but I, re- I agree with you on advantage disadvantage states. I just mm-hmm. like to take those things really literally when I run it. Right, you won't, you take them more more strictly. I, I understand that. So um, another thing about fifth edition that sets it apart from from previous editions is the philosophy that they implemented at the beginning of this game's creation. Um, that they dubbed rulings over rules philosophy. Um, this was the idea that like, we aren't going to write out the rules for every type of interaction that you can have. Like that's up to you and the DM. Like what is the DM's ruling? Like what feels right? Like don't worry about the exactness of the rules. Now, you know me, I love this shit. Like yeah. that's where I thrive. That's where I live. Yeah. Cause you can just be like, what yeah. makes sense for yeah. the situation? So for me, you know, like, this everyone is everyone usually agrees. Yeah. So for me, this is a perfect philosophy, but this has been actively changing over this last year and a half or so. And I find it so funny. And I don't mean that in like a condescending or negative way, but I just mean that in like, you know, the uh, We're going like full circle, the okay. idea of like those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it kind of thing or, or like, OK, so we're going to talk about Adventure Time for a second here. Um, spoilers for uh, season seven of Adventure Time, Marceline, the Vampire Queen. Jesus. She has a standoff with the Vampire King that she sealed away a thousand years ago or whatever. Um, and basically he doesn't want to fight and she wants to kill him. Because, you know, he he used to do a lot of bad things. But basically he asks her, like, how long have you been alive, Marceline? And she's like a thousand years. And he says, and what's the thing that you've learned in all this time? It's that, and she goes, it's that everything keeps repeating itself, but no one lives long enough to remember. So it just keeps repeating. Mm. That's what's happening here in (laughs) D&D. Is we have all these new people. I enjoyed that anecdote, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I love Adventure Time. I thought about that whole sequence in Adventure Time animation in my brain. I went into like real oh, like, nice. real oh, yeah. rounded soft lines. It's a it's a great show. That's a great season. Dynamic Marceline's colors. A great character. But what I'm trying to say here is that those of us who have lived long enough to see the pattern of the turning of the wheel <laughs> know that like what it was like when there was rules for everything. Mm-hmm. And some of us really liked that and some of us didn't. I'm one of the people that didn't. Um but now we have all these new people and all these new people that don't remember the way it was. Big complaints about structure. For and they want yeah. structure. Yeah. And they and the here's the thing is we're getting it now. It's slowly coming in, but it's a double edged sword. The complaints and, about structure filtered in through tweets. So yeah. like Jeremy Crawford, basically, mm, right, who was like right. forced to to, to reconcile yeah. the gaps here. Yeah. And, and it's so funny because it, it is the lack of, it is the rulings over rules philosophy that made this game as popular as it <laughs> is. Now everyone's clamoring for more structure. They're going to get it. And some of it's going to be good. Some of it's going to be not good. Right. And it's going to cause a lot of uh, rifts between the community. There's going to be a community that hates this rule, loves this rule, likes this homebrew. It's going to cause a lot of upheaval. And it's it's not going to just be this hunky dory good thing. It's well, no, going it's no, going to cause a lot 5. of problems. Five is the answer. Yeah, They're find the way. Oh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Know, right. I'm just saying. Be Maybe warned. Maybe they will though. But I I just like I love that they are like they have that shield right. Like uh-huh. the the thing we wrote at the beginning of the fucking first book we put out says to do whatever the fuck you want. But like right. here's the rules though. Yeah, here's the here's the here's rules. Here's what you asked for. You asked for. But also, for it. like, don't do that. Also, if you don't feel like it, right? And like, that's the spirit which of the is, game. Which is yeah, it's just ah, fun. Yeah, it's, it's this way to weird do it. line to straddle, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. How do they do it correctly? It really and please, is. Ev- you can't please everybody, <laughs> right? So, who are you gonna please? And like, are the people that basically are the people that you're sitting down at the table with? Like, which one of them is your is your person that's gonna be like there are, is a rule for this? And you are like that doesn't really make sense for the situation. Mm-hmm. And they're gonna be like. Why do we have rules if we don't follow them? And you're right. gonna be like, you don't understand. <laughs> no, you're gonna be like, leave my fucking table. Yeah, because <laughs> that's what I would do. Open the player's handbook and get to page five yeah, and tell exactly. me what you learned. Exactly. Okay, so let's move on. We're gonna talk about uh, the 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 upcoming five point five, which I think is due to hit uh, our shelves in 2024. Uh, what to expect? Mm. And so the first thing that I think is pretty we 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 can be pretty sure to expect is the floating slash and or customizable ability scores for all races. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's a great thing. Yeah. We're moving (laughs) away from pigeonholing like. Yeah. Orcs be strong. We are letting the features and traits define the the race rather than the ability scores. And it makes a lot of sense. Every race will be dynamic. Like Like, can be dynamic. Yeah. Because every race probably should be like it. If there's enough orcs out there, one of them's going to be a genius. You know what I mean? Yeah, law, like, law of large so, numbers. Yeah, right? so why should your orc wizard like 
be have all these negatives to being smart when like it's just bound to happen by you know just law of numbers i am a tall halfling hello right. exactly yes i'm a fooling is what I'm they call me aka yep. a human absolutely <laughs> um so that i think we're gonna expect that one thing i've heard them announce is and they recently did this and i missed it but they did a class survey um and oh yeah Play i don't on i don't know house. what the results were from that class survey but they have made it explicitly clear that the results of that survey are going to be reflected in 5.5 you know what i saw that too uh yeah. it must have been a big a big news hit um, uh, life's getting away from me in the holidays but like yeah absolutely i'll be back absolutely. on my news feed soon uh the ranger re- rework is probably what's gonna have uh, that's one a prediction i have from the results of the surveys the ranger will get finally reworked from the ground up, we will have a new version of the Ranger come 5.5. Yeah, it um, seriously needs it. Like, yeah. And, like, it's the Drake Warden is just not enough, like, overall. No, no, no subclass is enough. It needs to be re- reworked from the ground mm-hmm. up. Um, uh, another thing they announced is there are more surveys that will be coming between now and the launch of 5.5. I don't know what their surveys are going to be, but whatever the community... Um, whatever information they get from the community, they are going to act on, or so they have said. Yeah, there's also like the Adventurers League stuff. I think that we we kind of overlook a lot, um, and the the style of like they're really playing the game for like the, the that sort of stuff. Like they're playing they're playing a super meta version of like what we experience, right? Right. Um, so like I, I love the community driven thing. I think I think they have a like Wizards has a lot of mouths to feed. At this point, yes, and they've created that problem themselves. It sounds like it's a good problem to have. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, but like rounding it all out, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, where these surveys get us. Right. And, it, it and will who, be. Who is who's left with like one foot still in like the mud or whatever. You right. Know what you call it. Right. Um, I think another thing we can expect is that all the expanded spells from all the different books, you know, and all the expanded feats and all the expanded options will finally be in one place with the reprinting of uh, a handbook and whatnot, you know? Yeah, consolidating. Yeah. Um, like, because what do I got to be a Loxon on? I got to go by Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Yeah, or like, even if you just want to be a wizard, it's like, well, I want to know what all my spell options are. Why do I need to own 17 books to find all my spells? Yeah, what, yeah. Well, there's lots of spells kind of scattered now. They're like scattered. Xanathar, if you don't have Xanathar, you're missing a big chunk Xanathar, of Xanathar, Tasha's, um, Volos. No, Volos doesn't have spells, but the elemental uh, evil, the free one that you can download, that one has spells. Yeah, they fucking sprinkle spells yeah. in class and Chrono player Tree and Dunamancy. Into um, books like that. Like yeah. The books like Icewind Dale. Yeah. There's like magic. Now, now you got Strixhaven. Yeah. Like, like, dude, how am I supposed to? I Ravnica. Don't even, like, Theros, they all have unique spells. So, yeah, they're going to have to all be gathering one place. It's like finding a needle in a haystack sometimes. Yeah. Like, like, does D&D Beyond sort of solves it a little bit? A little with, bit. Like, you can buy an individual piece and of it can this all be for, like, in three bucks. Place, yeah. And then it lives in your D&D Beyond, right? right. Like, But then, like, if you don't know that there's a certain spell in Icewind Dale, like, there's two spells in that. I don't know how many spells are in Icewind Dale, if there are actually spells in Icewind Dale. But let's say there are, because I know they get sprinkled I don't think there in. are, for sure. But if there, or, like, a player option or something like that. Yeah. So, like, we have one player option, or like the feats from Strixhaven, right? Mm-hmm. Like, here are five feats. Right. Like, that's those are the feats from this book. If you don't kind of get the heads up on that from somebody, like, and you, there's just a, an option you're missing out on. Exactly. It's not presented to you. So, so yeah, I consolidation. Would, I would please. fully expect the consolidation of options for the most part. It's one of the most frustrating things, not only about playing the game, but like, like playing the game with new players and like doing the show is a little hard to track stuff down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and finally, I think what we can definitely expect and what has already begun to happen is we are we are finally probably moving on in a big way from Forgotten Realms. Okay, um, it's time. It's time. Like there's a lot of other um, settings out there. People are clamming for them. They've already announced they're going to bring in more. And with Fizzbands and with Mordenkainen's and with more stuff coming out, they are leaning hard into d d is a multiverse, mm-hmm. and thus there's many settings. And I, I'm i happy they're doing it. Yeah, and like leaning even harder, because I feel like that's kind of the base of 5e is a lot of multiverse talk. No, not until recently. Really? It's just been Forgotten Realms, Forgotten Realms, Forgotten Realms for like the first three or four years. Well, yes, but also <clears> like don't they write in the books like this is a multiverse? Like, Yeah, sure. They Yeah, they say that, but they don't actually give you anything. No, yeah, <laughs> they, they're giving yeah. you like here's ours and whatever yeah. you do is a multiverse of right. like this. Yeah, like, exactly. They, they've set it up nicely, and now, but now they're fleshing it out is what you're saying. Right. They're filling it, in the gaps. I wouldn't go as, like I, I guess I can never truly say that like going with Forgotten Realms as the default setting is was a 
mistake. Like, I always hated that they did it. I understood that it was a good business plan and it worked. And now it, they, they've they've ridden out that wave. That wave is over. It was a great decision. Now it's time to pivot. We're going multiverse. That's right. the next great decision. So they get to keep their cake and eat it too. Exactly. Which uh, which is something we know they do all the time. Yeah. But, Wizards loves know, cake. <laughs> they absolutely love cake. And what I love is probably a second short rest because I think we've been co- recording for a while. Oh, dang. Okay. <laughs> Two short rests, Will. I know. It's uh, been a while since we did an episode this long. We're back at it again. God damn it, DeGonzo. Shout um, out to DeGonzo. Shout out to DeGonzo. Join uh, his Patreon. Yeah. Or or, or uh, go say hi to him on Discord. Yeah. Um, so the last thing that I really want to kind of talk about it, when it comes to 5.5 is what we hope will make it personally. Like what I personally will hope and what, what you personally will hope will make it into 5.5. So I, I made a little bit of a list. Uh, my number one here is skill encounters. Um, you know, I, I do these all the way, all the time, skill challenges. Yes, okay. Um, I would love an official implementation of the idea. Um, and just maybe even ideas that I, I obviously don't have. Like, there are more encounters in D&D than uh, combat encounters. And we have this whole list of skills that I feel like doesn't get utilized as much as it should or to its full potential. And so I would love it if they came out with skill encounters as a concept and um, with different options of, for different types that you could do. Yeah, it's it's the obstacle course of D&D basically is what it right. feels like to me when we run them. Yeah. Uh, and actually Powered by the Apocalypse is really good at doing this thing with clocks. Uh, and every clock, it's like a pie chart, and you fill in one of the pieces when something happens, like a click. And it reminds me a lot of the skill challenge. Do you oh. want to explain the skill challenge, like and, and what it is and how we um, uh, how we implement it in our games? So my games, when I do skill challenges, it's taken from Chris Perkins' creation of skill challenges in Fourth Edition. And essentially, the idea is like everyone rolls initiative, and on any given player's turn. Whatever the situation, the, there will, there will be a set parameters of like what the goal of this non combat encounter is. Yeah. yeah. And Win the race, outrun this bad guy, outrun or, this bad like, guy, or you know, solve the room collapsing on you puzzle before it's too late. What you know, something. Stop along those the lines. ship from sinking. Yeah, exactly. And so on each character's turn, they get to use a skill. Um, in order to further the goal towards success. And so essentially the player will tell me what they want their character to do. We will assign a skill check to the thing. It's an open um, discussion kind it's of It's an thing. open discussion. It I want to do this. What skill fits that? It can be one skill check. It could be uh, a series of checks. And the DC can fluctuate depending on how difficult I think the thing they're trying to do is. Um, and uh, a failure is a tick mark in the failure column. A success is a tick mark in the successful column. As a DM, I decide whether I want to reveal how many successes they need to succeed. Um, it's oftentimes, like I a do five to three thing. Yeah, usually I'll do like three successes before three failures, or five successes before three failures, or something along and those that lines. That helps determine the difficulty. Yes, of things. and then um, success will lead to you know obviously they've achieved their goals and they got what they wanted. Failure in a skill challenge does not lead to death, but it leads to. Um, having to deal with a situation that they wouldn't have had to otherwise. Right. Whether that means combat or a loss to HP or being cut off from the thing they were trying to get to, and they have to find a new way now. Yeah, because you could, no matter, like, if the skill challenge is set up in such a way, like, you're going to make it to the end of from A to B, no matter what here, mm-hmm. but, like, what happened along the way could be, like, part of the failure. You know, like, right. you got... You got through the door before it shut, but like you also had to like get shot in the leg to right, do it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's your failure. Or the skill challenge can end in a total failure where you do not get the thing. The the bird you're trying to catch flies away and now you're left with to fight the competitor. Right. Something like that. Exactly. So it can end in a combat. It can end in like tears or like like, you know, just disappointment. <laughs> right. Exactly. There's a lot of versatility there. It's a lot of fun to play in one too. Um, and it, it's a good, I think one of the good rules about it is don't use the same skill twice. Typically yeah, is a yeah. good rule to follow. Uh, typically what I implement is, um, excuse me, don't use the same skill twice in a row and you can't use the skill that the previous person before you used. Okay. So they, there's no back-to-back arcanas and you can't use arcana back-to-back either. Right, right. That's that's good. It keeps it um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Like it, story-wise. The, the entire exercise is supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to encourage creativity 
in in storytelling in a cinematic fashion. Yeah. So and, and a lot of times I feel like players find ways to like kind of bend skills a little bit and utilize them in ways you normally wouldn't. Which is good. Yeah. Which is exactly. A fun thing. It's a lot of fun. And the nature of the skill challenge is that it is exciting. Like mm-hmm. there is excitement happening now. It's and very action based. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, so another thing I'd like to see with 5.5 is a lot more expansive options for exploration and downtime. Like when it comes to like exploration of the wilds or even a dungeon, like it's pretty basic. It's like I look over there or I'll roll perception. It's like, oh, you detect a trap. OK, I'm going to try and go around it. But it would be cool if we had, I don't know, lists of traps, lists of hazards, lists of like encounters that you can come across that are like not not. Uh, what's the word? Conf- conflicting. So it's not necessarily an enemy or an obstacle. It can be, uh, uh, I don't know, like an encounter with a particular type of animal. And like maybe this is an omen or maybe it's this or maybe it's a really cool ruin. And like maybe if you do a little bit of digging, a little bit of this, you'll find a little treasure and stuff like that. Like, g- like a whole bunch of ideas that it, it could be a random table or just something a DM can can scroll through for inspiration. It reminds me of the uh, the flower lady from Breath of the Wild that like you have to approach the shrine, but if you step on the flowers on the way there, she like oh she, yeah like, stops you from fucking moving exactly she, like, yeah makes you go sure. back to the start yeah absolutely. And then for downtime options, like give uh, players more things to spend money on, more like s- ideas of different services or different items they can spend or different like activities they can engage in. Um, obviously like I'm not usually the one to call for like more like for the game to think for me, but I do think like it, it is very useful to have like a whole list of things you never would have thought of. True. So yeah. I think traps is a really like pertinent one. Like, yeah. Getting unique with traps. Yeah. Is and coming like- from fourth edition, man, you talk about pages and pages of traps. Ooh, that's, yeah. that, I need to find that. Yeah. Um, cause traps are, traps can be really cool, but like it can be kind of hard to like, uh, like prep in a two week period and like be Mm -hmm. interesting with your traps when you have so much other stuff to think about. Like maybe that, like, I mean, traps are traps, man. Like they're going to do, they're going to do certain things. Is it going to, is it going to hurt you, hold you, uh, inflict a condition, do damage, et cetera, et cetera. What's, what's the goal. And then what does it look like? It's good to build traps backwards, but like that's, that, that can get like boring mundane. If I had a list of pre-made traps, like traps, traps, like if, I want a unique one. I just flip to page three and like roll a die and right. using this trap. Exactly. Exactly. That's kind of cool. Um, another thing that I thought about that I think would be interesting is if there were some h- optional hardcore rules. So like one of the things, and this is a good thing. Uh, one of the things that 5e and 4e before it began to really take out and have pretty much annihilated now are some of the more brutal rulings from like the old old editions the old saver dies or the longer lasting mm. diseases and effects and stuff like that like how there's disintegration ray rules where if you're right. below a certain hp you just fucking blow up yeah and so it would be cool if there was like an optional like hardcore play style that you could like point at in the rule book and be like hey guys so f- as a dm for this game that i'm running like we're going to run the hardcore rules so like certain things are going to work differently. Like stuff's going to be save or die. There's going to be brutal, more long lasting effects and stuff like that. That way, like everyone at the table can like get behind the idea of like, okay, this could be more brutal and people won't get so upset if bad okay. things happen to their characters. Yeah. Like it's, I could do that now as the DM, but if I had like actual rules in a book, I could point to something for my balanced. players, something balanced, something predetermined and, you know, arbited outside of the DM's description. Like it could make that play style a bit more acceptable and fun. Yeah. Prevent some finger pointing. Exactly. By, like, having some rules to, to fall back on. Like, yep. no, look, like I'm doing it because it's, it's here. Exactly. And, like we agreed to do this. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not just making up bullshit. Because right. it sucks when you play any game and somebody just starts spouting rules that weren't there at the beginning. Right. And making rulings that like seem a little bit more geared towards, you know, one favoring versus another instead of yeah. being fair. Sometimes that that like win mentality is hard to get rid of when you're playing a game yeah. like D&D and like yeah. You are against the dungeon master when they're coming at you hard like that. It feels like a competition. Right. It's not. It's, it's not. Or at least it's not supposed to be. It's always like we, we say this a lot, but it's always good to have conversations with your table, with your players. Like like everyone agree and consent to what we're about to do here. Yeah. Open so communication. No surprises, you know, and you don't want fe- people to feel attacked. Yeah, definitely not. 
Um, and then lastly, what I hope they implement is some stuff from 4th edition. And this is kind of an add-on to my criticism of uh, 5e monster stat blocks are boring. Um, the bloody condition was a really great concept in 4th edition, and we use it in our games. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, when a monster gets cut down to half HP, um, they're considered bloodied. Um, yeah, and many boss mechanics from platformers where, like, 4th uh, edition does good at, like... You got them. You got them bloodied. Like their new abilities kick on because now they're in a desperate way. Yeah, exactly. And so, like with that, like uh, state of being of being bloodied, it it, it could be a, a double a double edged sword. Where yeah, the monster stuff pops off. But like in fourth edition, there is another thing where it's like if you were an orc and you were fighting something bloodied, you were better at killing them because yeah. like your blood frenzy went off. Right. You know like I, mean? I, s- I see red. I s- exactly. I, s- I smell your weakness. And so bloodied being a state of being that then you could build mechanics around would be really cool if they reintroduce that as an optional rule or idea because I, I love it. I love it too. I I always kind of picture like you're not really hit severely until you're at half HP. Right. That's when you took like your first like flesh wound. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe you got bruises and bumped around. You got hit on the armor, like Mm -hmm. something like that. Right. And then like, I like a lot of people, uh, or not a lot of people, like people I see on the internet doing like, well, I don't actually like, like your HP is used to like, that's a pool that like counts as like energy to avoid attacks. And when you're bloodied, you finally got hit. Right. And and like that's I always thought that's cool. And now you're yeah, in danger. I think that's a cool concept for sure. I like adding uh, inner party conflict, uh, like volunteered inner party conflict. I guess like competition. Like let's have two players fight each other. Right. Like ending it at bloodied. Like you, oh, the first one to strike a blow. Yeah, I like that. That's really cool. It's fun. It's yeah, a, that is pretty cool. It's cool. Me and me and your special guest Jake have like really had a lot of fun pitting players against each other in our games. Mm-hmm. Like, let's see what this barbarian can do against this monk, mm-hmm. and like who can get there first. Like, right. What the balance is here. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's, I like it's that. a lot of fun, and and that's a good way to use bloodied. Yeah. Another implementation on the monster stat block that I would love to see implemented. And by the way, this is all just a wish list. I don't have any like uh, I've got. Oh, we're, no, yeah, we're not yeah. referencing data. Yeah, yeah. This, there's no data to back this up, but would be the implementation of another 4E concept called minions in which. So one of the things about 5E is it is the challenge rating system makes it so that an orc is an orc is an orc is an orc. No matter what level, an orc is X strong. Math is right. Math, math is math. Um, and the idea is that like, okay, well at low levels, yeah, uh, fighting one orc is tough. And then at mid levels, fighting one orc is easy and fighting a few is tough. And then at high levels, fighting a whole bunch is like, a hilarious. More, is hilarious. It's more appropriate. It's yeah. the idea, but it doesn't really translate great. And one of the things that 4E did was like, okay, well, we want to make it so that you fight a bunch of like enemies that were weaker or that are weaker to you now relative to your level but like we also don't want to waste a bunch of fucking time but we want them to be effective so what they did was they created this unit type called minions and a minion basically no matter what had one hp it was just one hit to kill a minion but their damage output scaled with your level so a level 20 minion would do level 20s worth of damage but was still just one hit to kill and it was a great way to throw a horde of enemies at your players um, while still, like, challenging them without it getting too bogged down by, like, like, keeping track of HP and this and that and yada yada. So, so in a superhero game that I run called Flashbang and Surgeon on yeah. Patreon, yeah. I I accidentally found a need for this without oh. knowing about oh. that. Oh, okay. And that's how I run a lot of, like, I ran enemies with HP at first, mm-hmm. but the game, the style of game we're playing is you are a superhero like like into Batman. Right. And you have like Batman skills and in a lot of Batman stuff, he fucking uses his action, his 6 seconds of action to like take down one to two enemies. Right. He right. can do that. He's exactly. Batman, right? Yeah. So like I have minions like grunts like you know like goons Mm -hmm. essentially that i throw a horde of goons at them and i was like this is a theatrical combat if you hit a guy he goes down exactly and all you have to do is like roll to not with the attack yeah hit the ac he's down and they go down and and i have basically said like these guys this pool of enemies is going to be one hit each 
there's 12 of them, really easy to have a big encounter and track it because they yep. go down fast. Exactly. They go down fast, but they're doing damage as they're going down. And then yeah. I have another harder version of the same style of combat where there's two hit guys. Right. Okay. And then a boss. Right. Right. Like Absolutely. The, like if Killer Cro- uh, Killer Croc, that's the Spider-Man. No, um, Killer Croc is uh, is Batman. The lizard is Spider-Man. Yes. So if Killer Croc is there, he's got four cronies with him. Mm-hmm. Those cronies are probably pretty tough. Or like Joker cronies are really elite, tough. You have elite minions. Yeah. They, <laughs> it was like I showed up with like big buff dudes from Arkham Asylum or right, whatever. And those right. guys are going to take two hits. And okay. The, but there's I, all, then there's only five of them. It's right, easy to track. Right. No, that's a, that's a, that's the exact same concept. And yeah, it's that's effective. Cool. It's yeah. funny how I found the need for it and didn't know. And like basically. You like, came up with it on your own. Yeah. Because yeah, like, it's, a, it's a pretty it's intuitive good. concept. Yeah, yeah, it's good. So that that's my wish list, and that's what I think also before what we talked about of what to expect. And that's that's basically my take on the state of the game. Did you want to add anything? Uh, just in the, the monster stat block stuff, it would be cool okay. to have like a flexibility. Like if you want to make this harder, here's a suggestion. Right. And they do have some variant abilities on some monsters. But, yeah, it would be cool if it was more universal and if it was designed more for like if you want this to be. A, a harder fight or a more interesting fight. Here's an option. I feel like they did. They're trying to do that, but with the cookie cutter aspect that they're mm. taking with the mythic actions. Like, oh yeah, they're trying to like yeah. layer some stuff on to make things more unique and complicated. Right. But like, it's really just more of the same. It feels like it kind of is. Yeah, it's like it does more. Like, because you want to fight one guy, right? But you need to make it feel like yeah. you're fighting a hundred. As guys. a matter of fact, the mythic option for the Doolahan is reminiscent of a bloodied boss fight. Right, like, yeah. He's been bloodied. All this crazy stuff happens. Now. I got the feel. So yeah, yeah, that's maybe that is what they're doing. And I so like maybe that. We'll see more of that. You know, Mega Man obviously is like a huge proponent of like the you got the the boss is starting to steam because he's and his armor looks broken. He's right. gonna try to fuck you up even harder. Right. He exactly. wasn't taking you seriously, and now Before. he's panicking. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, with that being said, I think we can get ready for the long rest. We should. Yeah. All right. It's name of beholder. Let's do it. It just it is. <laughs> it's the right name. Hey everybody, welcome to the long rest. We're going to complete the Beholder now. We didn't decide the name. Destiny did. Destiny decided the name. Okay, we'll draw the circle, and I'll draw the eye stalks, and uh, light the candles, and Mm -hmm. um, we'll start the chant. Okay. We're going to bring all these Beholders to life. Oh, but first we have to name the last one. Sorry. Yes. We got Grinion. Grinion. I, okay, I propose (laughs) Grinion the Grunion, but. Grinion, well, what is Grunion? I don't know. Like uh, a, see, I barely know onion. what Grinion is, and I wanted it to be Grix Minion. <laughs> no, it's just he's a, green, green, he's a minion. green minion. He's a floating green minion. Yes. Uh, Gr- Grinion the, okay, oh, Grinion the Graduate. Grin- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he graduated from Strixhaven. Is he a fucking Pokemon NPC? Like you're fighting a, gr- a graduation train, your schoolboy fucking. Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Grinion the Graduate. Gr- Grin- he's an educated beholder. Grinion, Grinion the smart boy. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, maybe draw him smiling. Definitely. He's a happy boy, for sure. For sure. Because he grins. For sure. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us this year for Year of the Beholder. I um, hope you guys had a happy holidays. Very excited uh, going into 2022, the new year, which we're still not going to announce. 2022 Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, it's or be, as they say, 2022 year of the, you'll find out next episode. Yeah, next episode, <laughs> check it out, baby. We're going to do it big. Uh, 2022 electric bugaloo is what they say in the UK because they oh. pronounce it bugaloo. Do they really? Yeah. Is that a thing? Well, I heard a guy do it. So okay, interesting. One person does it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we really appreciate you guys. Um, thanks for getting us to uh, 1,000 iTunes reviews. I mean, keep them coming. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, that's Basically, thanks for all the love and support. We love and uh, support you guys. And uh, hope send, you guys have a very happy new year. Send us a postcard. Uh, indeed. P.O. box that we set up because you said you wanted to. You said you <laughs> would send me something. Send me something. It's true. Um, and with that being said, I think we could call it a game. We can call it a game if you check out our Patreon. Yeah, check out our Patreon. Super Quest Saga. Do we want to do some Super Quest Saga news? It's coming. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, we said we'd be back on November on 21st, and then, uh, like, the baby came early. Yeah, the baby came early. So, our bad. Oh, yeah. Well, not our bad, but... Well, like, about announcing it. Like, yeah, kinda, that's true. Like, the that's way we true. did. Sorry. Uh, the aim is to come back sometime towards the end of January, probably shoot the next episode mid-January, but, you know, it's a yeah. little bit up in the air still. We need to be fluid with it. 
sorry yeah. and thank you for your patience and understanding. We know people are like, what the fuck happened? And we're like, don't worry, we're going to do it. Yeah, we, we just, got we like 10 time. episodes left. We're going to get through it. We it's going to be good. Like regular life stuff to hash out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we've... We had a fun year. We really appreciate it. We're ready to move on, though. I'm excited for the next thing. Yeah, I'm excited for the next thing. Um, I'm excited for the new art that we commissioned. New art on the great. way. Patreon, watch out for that. Um, I think now we can call it a game. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Hello, everybody. This is Tom Case. And this is Will Stark. Will, could you imagine if we had our own podcast? Dude, could you imagine? What if the Loch Ness Monster was real? Do you think they would open, like, essentially a quote-unquote Jurassic Park for this? Oh, no, no. They're not going to let anyone look at it. What if your house was haunted? Mm -hmm. Let's say it was a woman. She wants companionship. No. You know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm not talking about, like, love or sex or anything. Okay, cool. You know, I I was going to bring this up, but I knew you were going to say no, so. What if someone close to you was a werewolf? Set up a camera. It would still be a full mood, so she would turn into a wolf monster. Go out tonight, probably kill some people. Oops. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, nothing I can do about that. The best in what-if entertainment. Just search Dude Could You Imagine anywhere podcasts can be found.